and a few people did message and let me know that they weren't able to make it today. A couple of people are getting their vaccinations, which is wonderful. Uh, and you got to go when the vaccination's ready, right? So, um, and uh, Mike has a funeral. So it's just kind of some of those things. But I'm really glad you're all here. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of these ideas and have conversation. Um, so I'll introduce myself, I guess. I'm usually introducing people, but I'll let you know a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador originally. And I usually start with that because that's a place of pride for me. But uh, as a feminist, I think too, it's important to identify kind of where I am as part of what shapes me, informs me and informs my spirituality in a big way. Uh, the sea and the sky and all those good things that are part of who I am. Um, I did a lot of my education uh, in Halifax and Ottawa, and then I've been with Windhome Christian Church for six years now, I think. So it's it's amazing how time has, has gone. Um, and I'm really glad to be there. I teach a little bit for the Atlantic School of Theology and really delighted to have that as part of my life too. And uh, my hubby's away right now, so I'm a little bit sad, but, uh, and he's going to be gone for a while. So I've been talking so much more to the cats. <laughs> I think they're looking at me like, why are you talking to us again? Like, it's just crazy. So anyway, um, I am very delighted to be here. And I was going to put us in the breakout groups and I might still do that with like pairs of you. And what I'd like you to do is share with one another um, what has been a memorable spiritual experience for you. And I'll give you a couple minutes, a memorable spiritual experience. Um, it can be something in your life that just kind of has always stayed with you. It can be something that last week that was meaningful to you, whatever uh, you think about that you associate with the spiritual so I am going to put us in the breakout groups, and that's your question. And so um, I'm going to give us about 10 minutes, I think, to come up with some ideas around that. And now I'm going to create, let's see how my math is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're going to create three breakout groups. And uh, your question again is around a spiritual experience for you, a memorable spiritual experience. And how would you describe it? What are the feelings that you associate with it and, and any thoughts that you have about it? So again, I'll give you about 10 minutes. So see you back then.
That was a fast 10 minutes. <laughs> it goes quickly. What's up, Debbie? You're on mute. I was saying, I think for other people too, since we were the first ones back, other people found the 10 minutes go quickly as well. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So I'm going to invite uh, any sharing that you would like to um, tell us about in your groups. Um, I hope you had a chance to introduce yourselves and just chat a little bit about your memorable spiritual experiences. So just with the large group, if you want to unmute and if there's anything that you wanted to share about that experience. Janet? I just wanted to share. It was wonderful. It was April and Debbie and I were in a group and we know each other quite well. So that was that was lovely. But there was a theme that seemed to run through all of our experiences. And that was that there was a sense in a, in, in a moment of chaos or turmoil or challenge, there was a moment of comfort and and faith, really, right? That we were that as April said, we we're, were not walking alone at that time. So there was a, there was a commonality between all three of us, which I found. Great, thank you. Carolyn. I think I'm going to say the same thing. I was with um, Elizabeth and Hubert. And, and um, the interesting thing was that um, for a while, we weren't sure we were being specific, but the whole idea was that in small things, there was an awareness of God. And and Elizabeth also mentioned um, uh, something about a, a minister that really touched her, right? But but it was it was interesting that it was also in just little small incidences, <laughs> you know, that seemed to to remind us that God cared for us. I guess. Anyway. Thank you. Oh, um, in our group, we talked about different moments in our lives, and I think we had touched on feelings, like feeling um, at peace and also um, a connection to nature mm. in some of those moments, too. Great. Thank you. All right. So that's just kind of an exercise to get us thinking about um, what it means to be a people of spirituality and what it means to have spirituality in our lives um, and have spiritual moments and experiences. So I'm going to change this, I guess, to the speaker view, and then I'm going to share my screen with you, hopefully. And uh, that's, we'll get going on a PowerPoint. Is that good? Does everybody see that? Wonderful. Good. Okay, so we are at, let me just be conscious of the time. And what I'm gonna invite you to do as we go along is reflect on if you have questions, just kind of jot them down or make a mental note to yourself and we'll get back to those at the end. Um, but I'd rather kind of we keep the flow and keep moving through the things that we'll talk about today. So basically what we're gonna talk about a bit, and this is really introductory, uh, is to just share with you some thoughts around spirituality, uh, spiritual practices, and then to consider spirituality in the light of a feminist lens, uh, feminist spirituality, and to talk a bit about social justice. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we'll be doing today. So spirituality begins with lived experience in relation to the divine. And basically in very broad strokes, that is a way that we can define spirituality. And we've talked a bit about what memorable spiritual experiences have happened for us. I remember when I was confirmed, I was Roman Catholic growing up. And I remember this kind of really visceral experience of kind of a, a, a gush of something that kind of happened. It was like an overwhelming um, experience since it was a little bit, wasn't fearful, but it was a little bit odd, but it was also very joyful. So it's, I think spirituality can be a mix of all kinds of things. It's not necessarily one thing, 
what can be many things and many feelings. Uh, and thank you for participating in that little exercise today that kind of gets us going. Um, spirituality can be defined as a way of living in response to an experience of the divine in our lives. So it's experiential. Uh, John Swinton and Pattison write, the quest for meaning, purpose, self-transcending knowledge, meaningful relationships, love and commitment, and for some, a sense of the holy among us. So that sense of holiness really has broad strokes across many different traditions and ways of life, not particularly attuned to the Christian life, although included in it. An expression of spirituality includes a sense of purpose, a sense of connectedness, being in relationship with the self, with God and with others, a quest for wholeness. And at the root of the word salvation, salus, is really about being whole. What does it mean to become a whole people or whole persons? It's a search for hope, isn't it? When we think about our religious, experience and what we're doing as a church. Hopefully hope is a big part of that and how we can communicate that hope is a challenge sometimes. A sense of transcendence. So it's not all about me, right? I used to have this, I don't know if you know, Happy Bunny. He was this sarcastic little bunny that uh, was around in the late 80s or 90s or something like that. He always said silly things. And one of the things he said is, it's all about me. Well, this is, it's not all about me. It's about the relationships that are part of our lives. And so it's not just what's happening in my life, but it's what's happening around the world. It's what's happening in different pockets of the world. And with COVID-19 especially, we're now all very aware of all the um, injustices in many ways that are happening around the world. And we're trying to do something to remedy that. So that's all part of what makes that awareness meaningful. Uh, it's not just for the sake of it, but what do we do with that when we know that awareness? Um, spirituality, and I'm going to make this larger so you can see it a little bit better, has many practices. And these are some of the contemplative practices that you can think about when uh, you think about becoming a more spiritual person or maybe just developing some really positive habits uh, for life that kind of help us, um, you know, grow and become as people. So if we start kind of on the left and we go around, we're not going to get into the specifics of all of these, but I like kind of the different branches. You'll see like in the, on the trunk, there's various kind of uh, words that describe these different categories. So stillness, generative practices, creative practices, activist practices, relational practices, movement practices. So, you know, we're not very good at this in the church, but getting up and moving and, and dance and kind of yoga and all these qigong and, and all of these different things that might be part of a physical embodiment of what spirituality means. And then ritual, which we're all familiar with. So whether we do worship services or we um, go out in nature and we take walks that get us in touch, or maybe we have cultural traditions that get us in touch with what our spirituality is. So that's just for you kind of a, a way of looking at what these contemplative practices can contribute to a life of spirituality. And today we're going to talk a bit about the activists, right, which is that branch that's going up and you know, pilgrimage could be part of that, but also vigils and marches. Uh, I really liked that at the General Assembly, when Terry Hort Owens was elected as the disciples' new president and general uh, minister, she was given a protest sign. And I thought that was very meaningful to think about. And, you know, one of my questions, I guess, for today is how do we think about protest or protestants? But do we think about protest? in terms of our spiritual lives and, and does it have meaning for us? Um, and you know that could be a negative meaning, it could be a positive meaning, it could be somewhere in between. So those are just some ideas. And, and I had the, the uh, source of that, that's not my creation, but it's a beautiful creation 
so that you know where uh, you can look that up and get it. And all this will be available to you as well. <clears throat> Christian spirituality is a sense of the divine through the person of Jesus, the Christ. Of course, we know the Christ means the anointed. Specific study of Jesus as God is called Christology, so the study of Christ. Theology is the study of God, a language that for humans can express something about our belief about God. We know that human words can never capture really who God is. Um, and many different traditions have many different ways of expressing who God is. But theology is a language that allows us to at least uh, take, a, take a shot at it. And this changes. We know that God is always revealing God's self to us and that revelation is ongoing. It's not something that just started 2000 years ago and ended when the Bible was shut. It's something that continues for us every day. So I guess one of the major questions really of spirituality is how is God still speaking to us and how can we discern uh, how that's happening for us? The study in language for the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology. And that is something that's a whole discipline within the study of the church. Expressions of spirituality in today's world are many differing and diverse celebrations of what it means to be a spiritual person. And I really like that a lot of people um, I know from yoga or from other traditions, um, Buddhist traditions, Hindu traditions, um, many people who don't express any uh, belief system, but still themselves are very rooted in compassion and injustice. So those to me are very spiritual people as well. Uh, it may not be a designation that they give themselves, um, but I think that's something that is really covered in kind of a, what Carl Rahner would call anonymous spirituality. But I don't like that term, so I'm not going to use it. <laughs> but that is something that uh, appeals to a lot of people. But as a person who's married to somebody who's an atheist, it's really interesting when we have conversations. Uh, and the meaning of, you know, life, when you think about it, in, is so possible to be communicated in so many different ways. And even within Christianity, there are a myriad of ways to discover and express what it means to be spiritual and have a spirituality and to be a follower of Jesus. If we asked everybody today, you know, what does it mean to be a follower? We'd all have different responses. And we know that's something that the disciples are very proud to say, that we are a church that, uh, and denomination that allows for multiple expressions of the way in which we understand ourselves. For today, as I say, we're going to explore some feminist spirituality and consider insights in relation to social justice in our world. We'll also consider spirituality in relation to ecological well-being and the earth. And uh, there's a whole movement that is a fantastic and wonderful movement called ecofeminism in the church. And uh, certainly if you're interested in that area, there are a number of books and I, I do have a bit of a bibliography at the end uh, and suggest some to you, but that's a whole field of amazing writers out there uh, in feminist circles who are really bringing together uh, conversations about social justice and the earth and ecological well-being. So I recommend ecofeminism to you. And we'll do this specifically, but not exclusively through a Canadian lens. So we'll think about some of these matters today. Beginning with feminist theology. The term feminist is at the heart of women's identities in the world. At the foundation is feminism, a concept of women's well-being in the world, access to resources, how women experience themselves in the world, how women express and practice their spiritual or religious or spiritual beliefs, and how women uh, from economic, political, gender, social, sexual, psychological, ethnographic, and a host of other ways are part of our identity. So all those matters of who we are. Uh, when I introduced myself, I said I was from Newfoundland and Labrador, and that was a big part of my identity. So again, that shapes my spirituality. And all those matters that are part of who you are in your life would also shape your spirituality. And it also um, contributes to how we understand other people and how we perceive what other people are communicating to us. There's a whole host of kind of um, biases and 
presumptions and ideas that we already have as part of our worlds. And it's not good or bad, it's just simply part of who we are. And feminism tries to be aware of those things so that when we look at uh, what we believe, we try to be aware of our own biases and our own assumptions that sometimes shape uh, what, what we say, what we do in the world and how we understand things like who God is uh, or the meaning of being spiritual. Merriam-Webster defines feminism as a theory of political, economic, and social equality of the sexes, and also adds that feminism is organized activity on behalf of women's rights. Rosemary Radford Ruther was one of the very first feminist theologians that I read, and probably would be familiar to a lot of people who know a little bit about feminist theology. She wrote many, many works. If you glance at my uh, bookshelf, you'll see probably 10 of her books there. Um, she says, the critical principle of feminist theology is the full promotion of the full humanity of women. Whatever denies, diminishes, or distorts the full humanity of women, therefore, is appraised as non-redemptive. So that's a powerful statement when we think about it, right? And, you know, if we think about Black Lives Matter, right, this is a conversation that has been happening lately, and some people say, well, all lives matter, and isn't it enough to say all lives matter? Well, for me, I struggled with that at the beginning of the conversations around Black Lives Matter. But when I thought about it with my feminist hat on, I said, well, I would say women's lives matter. And I understand the need to still say that because there's still oppression of women. And as a woman, I understand that and I've experienced that. So that gave me a bit of a more of an understanding of what it means to have to, have to and to want to say, Black Lives Matter today, Indigenous Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter, and to be able to name um, people because they have not been named and have not been included in that full promotion of full humanity. So I really like that definition from Rosemary Radford Ruther because I think it's a powerful one for us to think about and continue to think about and relate to um, social justice struggles that are in the world today. And I recommend any of her writing. She's a pretty clear writer and somebody that's pretty uh, easy to understand and one of the pioneers in, in white feminism anyway uh, of the conversations that have happened. She's still Roman Catholic and she still attends uh, her church. So I can imagine some of the conversations that she has with <laughs> her local priests. Three waves of feminism. So feminist history can be divided into three waves. First wave occurring in the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, mainly concerned with women's right to vote, which is a very important thing. Um, we know that that happened really not too long ago in Canadian context. The second wave at its height in the 1960s and 70s referred to the women's liberation movement for equal legal and social rights. The third wave began in the 1990s and refers to the continuation of and reaction to the second wave of feminism. First wave feminism promoted equal contract and pro rights for women opposing ownership of married women by their husbands. Imagine, I mean, when we, when we think back on this, right, that uh, a lot of this has happened fairly recently. Uh, so we understand that the struggle that women have is have has had and continue to have is very real. By the late 19th century, feminist activism was primarily focused on the right to vote, which was something that was super important at that time, still is very important today and is not assured in many countries. Um, and we have heard in the States about uh, voter uh, suppression and those realities, and they happen all over the world. So that's something for us to keep in mind that the right to vote is something that's not easily given sometimes. Second wave feminism in the 1960s and 1980s focused on issues of equality and discrimination. The second wave slogan, the personal is political, identified women's cultural and political inequalities as inextricably linked and encountered women to understand how their personal lives reflected sexist power structures. Betty Friedman was a key player in second wave feminism. In her book, The Feminine Mystique, uh, was something that really was a seminal work for many. And to think about the roles of child rearing and homemaking 
but also to think about how women could step outside those roles and be in other roles in society and balance all of those together. Third wave feminism began in the early 1990s, responding to perceived failures of the second wave and a backlash against second wave initiatives. Uh, this ideology seeks to challenge the definitions of femininity that grew out of the ideas of the second wave, arguing that the second wave overemphasized experiences of upper middle class white women. And that is very true. So uh, the Rosemary Radford Ruthers, Elizabeth Johnsons of the world, um, were challenged by women who were writing, as Maria Diaz, um, many others who were writing from perspectives around the world who said, that's not our reality. What you're writing about is just strictly very academic. Uh, it's not really taking into account uh, the categories of race, race, ethnicity, class, religion, gender, all of the things that are so significantly part of women's lives in so many places in the world, part of all of our lives, but especially for women who are living in poorer countries. Um, and also they challenged the notion that, um, it, and of course for women, white women, uh, the reality of men being part of that conversation was not something that really came up a lot of the time, but feminism realizes that it's not only women that are experiencing oppression and suffering in the world, it's men who are not part of a privileged upper white uh, system that is serving their needs and their needs only. So it is uh, black and indigenous men and men who are not part of that kind of normative culture uh, also experience oppression. So women uh, from around the world started to say, you know, it's not just about women, but it's about women in conversation with these men who also experience this. And so if we're gonna have true liberation and redemption, we have to talk about all our relationships in our uh, homes, in our workplaces, in our society. The first writers in feminist theology, as I said, were grounded in a very academic approach to feminism and produced works which reflected uh, critiques and challenge to biblical texts, liturgical practices and language that was all often exclusive. Um, understandings about God and Jesus that did not echo and reflect women's experiences. And they recognized that the church often left out or intentionally discarded and neglected the experiences of women. So writers, uh, including Phyllis Tribble, um, Elizabeth Schutzler Fiorenza, Rosemary Radford Ruther, and Mary Daly were some of those white women who were writing at the beginning of feminist theologies. And their work was really seminal. Um, so any of those, you know, you could take up a book by them and learn a great deal. So Mary Daly's famous statement was, if God is male, then the male is God. So if that's the way we understand who God is, then that becomes an exclusive way of understanding. Uh, so can we open that up? Is it possible to open that up? I had heard too that in some of her lectures, she actually banned men from speaking because she felt that women needed to have for once in their lives, uh, have their voices heard. And so she told men that they could not speak in her class. So that's interesting to think about, right? That kind of a strategy. And it certainly got people talking. <laughs> this statement reflects on how women's experiences, spiritualities, and women's bodies are not held with honor in patriarchal traditions and systems that have chosen not to uphold women's stories and places in history and in the Bible and other sacred texts. Questions of feminist theology. So what, you know, there are many, many questions, but these are just a few that we can think about. Can we use diverse language about God that is not exclusively male? The answer is yes, of course. Um, but in some traditions, you would never know it. And not a lot has been known about how women's experiences and women in scripture and how feminine imagery for God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit actually exists in our tradition, but is very rarely talked about. Writers critique the biblical text and the history of the church and call for expanding our stories and traditions to include more of women, women's experiences. What other voices are not being heard? So that's one of the major questions of feminism and feminist theology to say, where are the voices in our society 
that are being suppressed, that are not being heard? And what are the histories that need to be looked at again so that we can include more of people's experiences? Feminism also writes about dualism that happens, these kind of false uh, divisions that have been created in patriarchal traditions um, that divide, for instance, heaven and earth, body and soul, and so on. They encourage, feminists encourage a reintegration of these concepts for a healthier and more inclusive understanding of what it means to be human and what spirituality is all about. After these writers, other writers began to emerge to say that the feminist writers did not include their experiences as women of color, women of varied economic status, women who lived outside North America and Europe. So it was a very Eurocentric approach, that original um, way. And even uh, North American, and it's not even North American because it was a very American uh, approach. And still, I think we struggle to really hear any Canadian uh, sides and Canadian language around uh, theology. But there are really good people out there in the Canadian uh, context talking about and speaking and writing about theology. New voices included the writings of Asa Maria Diaz and others in Mujerista theology. Black women wrote from the context of what they called womanist theology, and we'll share some of those reflections in North America in that context. There were those who wrote from an African context and really all around the world. Asian women wrote from their experiences in India, Korea, and in many other places around the world. And that really expanded what feminist theologians were thinking and writing about. I can remember when I was doing my doctoral dissertation uh, and I wrote on women's experiences as fishers and fish plant workers during the um, closure and the moratorium and, and the collapse of the codfish fishery in the early 1990s uh, in Newfoundland. And um, I can remember as I was reading womanist theology, I felt like Newfoundland women had more in common really with the experience of what womanists were saying, as opposed to what these upper uh, white middle-class uh, feminists had been saying. So it was really, it's really interesting to think about our own experiences in the context, various contexts of what has been written and what women are saying. Um, they look to the works of women mystics in the historical traditions of the church and stories of women in the Bible as stories to be celebrated and lifted up, to be restored as important parts of our history and stories in which the divine can also be embodied as feminine as well as masculine. The later waves of women writing in theology also identified the importance of lifting up the oppressed and injustice in people of color also and people who are not of the middle class. So not all white people are wealthy. Right. So what is the experience of people who are white and who are poor? And that's something that uh, William Barber, who Reverend Dr. William Barber, uh, the second in the States, uh, in his, um, you know, poor people's campaign is something that he lifts up and kind of bringing everybody together. The later waves of women writing in theology also identified the importance of, oh, I said that already. They critiqued early feminist theologians' writings for not including the experiences of many women and others in the world. So we're gonna just take a peek. Uh, there's so many different groups of women writing that we don't have time to look at all of that today. And we wouldn't do it justice to do that uh, within uh, such a short period of time. But we're just gonna introduce a little bit the ideas of womanist theology, because it's one of my favorite in terms of feminist theologians. The language of womanist comes from the work of Alice Walker in her writing In Search of Mother's Gardens. The concept of womanist allows women to claim their roots in black history, religion, and culture. The concept of womanist comes from a black folk expression, you acting womanish, which means outrageous, audacious, courageous, and willful behavior. Walker says a woman committed to survival and wholeness of an entire people. 
womanist is a black feminist, um, feminist color. Womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. I kind of like that expression. And it helps to understand kind of where we're coming at things from. It's kind of, uh, yeah, that's better. Womanist theology seeks to explore black people's experience and story in relation to biblical, theological, ecclesiastical, social, economic, and other materials important for the work of womanist theology. There are also many wonderful and important works in Black theology authors, including James Cone and others that wrote about the importance of Black images, stories, and truth-telling in the church and society. A seminal work uh, is by uh, Dolores Williams' Sisters in the Wilderness, and she was one of the first people I read as well, and that I found very powerful in thinking about um, what it means to be writing about women's experiences, but not for women not to call themselves feminists um, and to claim other language that better communicates about what their experience is. Salvation as wholeness. Monica Coleman is a womanist and she describes, and I think this is beautiful, in the black community, in her book, um, Making a Way Out of No Way, a womanist theology, she describes a woman who has come in after an experience of um, abuse. Uh, and she comes into her sisters and she sits with them and talks and she receives comfort from them as they braid her hair. And so Monica Coleman describes this as an act of salvation for that woman. And I think it's a really beautiful way of thinking about how a woman is restored to wholeness uh, and tying that idea of wholeness and what it means to be made whole, salvation with an everyday experience and this kind of bonding that happens between sisters. So I recommend her book. It's a really wonderful one uh, to think about uh, and understand some of the concepts and experiences of Black women especially. All these expressions of theology are grounded in the struggle for justice, to recognize the dynamics of privilege and power, and to begin to ask how we can be part of creating safe and supportive spaces in the church and society for all. This is the meaning of social justice, and we'll explore some of this conversation on social justice after we explore feminist spirituality a bit within the Canadian context. So we're gonna switch gears a bit from uh, talking about feminist theology, but that gives you a bit of a background um, to what feminist spirituality then explores. But feminist, whether it's theology or spirituality is really all about asking about the dynamics of privilege and power and how we can break down some of those barriers in society. From a Canadian lens, spirituality is our lived response to the realities of our lives and our response to an experience of the divine in our personal lives and the places of our community living. Our identity is a large part of who we are and how we believe. Many feminists believe identity is very fluid and is constructed. We're not born any certain way and we adopt and construct who it is we are and those elements of our identity. And so there are many parts of our identity that shape who we are. And we'll explore a little bit of this in relation to ecology in the Canadian context through feminist spirituality. When we're thinking about the phrase identity, I wanna borrow this definition from the United Methodist Church and the document is below there, the website where I found this, but I think it's a very good one. And it says our identity is more than our names or where we live or the groups with which we associate. Identity is comprised of those characteristics, qualities, values, beliefs, morals, ethics, expressions, abilities, and patterns of behavior that make a person or group who they are and who they have the potential to become. I really like that last part, who they have the potential to become because it, it talks about how we're not static in our lives. And spirituality is very much the context of that, that we're always growing and becoming. So what is the goal? Well, 
One of the questions that comes from a feminist spirituality is how can we make room for more voices? This is the main question that came out of women's theologies, womanist, feminist, muharista, Asian, and so on. What does spirituality feel and look like within our times and our own contexts? And what do we take from that uh, kind of more academic or more conceptual ideas about theology? And how do we respond to that in terms of our actual lived experience with the divine? How does the place we, shape, we live, for instance, shape who we are? Um, and if you're from the mountains, you might find that that shapes your spirituality. If you're from the sea, you might find that that has a bigger place in your spirituality. Um, if you live in the city, that might experience, influence your spirituality. If you live in a more rural setting, that influences how you experience God and other people. So all these things are something to think about in relation to spirituality. Social identity includes what is not limited to gender, ethnicity, class, nationality, sexual orientation, age, religion, language, and political affiliation. Social location is a person's place in the world in relation to many of these factors and many others. Our social location and our identity shapes our access to privilege and power, basic rights, and the place of decision-making that we have in society and in the church. In Christianity, we are guided by our ecumenical work for an understanding of the spirit, which of course the spirit is part of that understanding of spirituality. We live and inhabit certain places in the world and society and within our communities and our churches, and we take on certain roles. Our lived experiences are essential to an understanding of spirituality. Joanne Wolski Cohn describes spirituality from a feminist perspective as, quote, the totality of the human experience energized by an inner drive for self transcendence. And again, that sense that there's something larger than me, but that I'm part of that. And that is for moving beyond self maintenance to reach out in love, in free commitment to seek truth and goodness. There is an experience of the holy that speaks to us of the promise of hope. And it comes to touch us, dwell within us, and it is also beyond and larger than us. And this is the spirit. This spirit is experienced by all peoples in the context of a religious belief or simply within human experience, when we know that which in life is life-giving and that which brings us hope. Feminist spirituality concerns itself with how we live for justice how we live into compassion and how we denounce structures that have stripped away women's rights and experiences. Feminist spiritual practice seeks to explore and understand power dynamics, relationship building, nurturing relationships for the benefit of all life and consistently not only human life. And one of the questions from feminist spirituality might be, what is blossoming from our awareness and our understanding for a new vision of God's justice? So the belief that God is doing something new. We can reimagine, and this is something that feminist theologians and people in feminist spirituality do, uh, reimagining our tradition and our history from a feminist perspective and thinking about God and Christ and the spirit, not just in um, masculine terms, but in gender neutral terms or also in feminine terms. So feminist spirituality draws from the tradition of the goddess spirituality that existed for centuries long before the three major Abrahamic traditions and lifted up women's experiences, rituals and ways of being in the world. The writings of Carol Christ and others tell the story of those matriarchal traditions. We can imagine God, Christ, and the spirit in feminine or gender neutral terms. Christian writer and theologian Catherine Hawkes says, feminist spirituality is the reclaiming of the reality and power designated by the term spirit and the effort to reintegrate the spirit and the body, heaven and earth, culture and nature, eternity and time, public and private, male and female. And that's from a great book called Women's Spirit Rising. It's an older book now, but it's very much uh, foundational to feminist spirituality. 
This is an image, uh, it's called Sophia Wisdom. And I just want to talk about that a little bit and I'll uh, try to make this uh, something that you can see. Um, so here you have represented the kind of reddish figure uh, is Sophia Wisdom. And you'll see Jesus is above her. To the left, on my left, is Mary, who is the mother of God. And it's interesting to see this kind of a feminine um, depiction of wisdom. It's not something that we are used to. And this is an icon uh, in the Eastern tradition. Um, and it's something that we can think about when we think about what it means um, to think, you know, imagine God or imagine Christ uh, in a feminine form. <clears throat> Let me just go back up here. So the question is, and this is from a wonderful uh, little article by Joyce Rupp, who is Sophia in the Bible? Well, Sophia is a figure in scripture in the Judeo-Christian tradition and embodies a feminine divine aspect of God. Now, she is pretty much a metaphorical figure. So it's not something someone who existed historically, but it's all about understanding the divine that can be expressed as both masculine and feminine. Proverbs describes Sophia wisdom as present at the beginning of creation. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When God established the heavens, I was there playing before God all the while. And that's from Proverbs 8. Sometimes wisdom is embodied as a habit or a practice but also there are references to wisdom in the feminine pronoun, especially from 33 AD to 4 to 5 AD in our time. So Sophia wisdom and God can both be divine presence in our scriptural uh, tradition. So Sophia almost in some uh, representations is God, is kind of a feminine embodiment of God. In the Book of Wisdom, Sophia guides the Israelites through the desert. And it says she led them. Whoops. Let me go back. No, I need to go ahead. Oh, no. Sorry. Just lost my plate there for a second. Um, in the Book of Wisdom, Sophia guides the Israelites through the desert. She led them by a marvelous road. She herself was their shelter. And we know we hear about God traveling with the community through the day as a cloud and by the night as a pillar of fire from the book of Exodus. So it's interesting to, to hear both of those. Um, the book of wisdom is a book that's included in the Catholic canon, uh, but not in the Protestant canon uh, in the Bible. So it's interesting to think about those things that are sometimes included and those things that are not included in you know, what we use for our worship. Uh, and scripture. People in the early church prayed to Sophia as part of their Christian tradition, but this was suppressed because of an association with goddess traditions um, that was the previous religious practice. This included worship of the feminine divine, and the early Roman church gradually disconnected from the tradition, from the tradition of Sophia as the feminine divine god. So it's something very interesting to think about and do more research on and to think about, you know, who, how is it that we can imagine God? Is it something that we can imagine um, as feminine? In Jewish, Jewish scripture, Sophia is a feminine voice. Some draw strong parallels between who Sophia is as a divine feminine embodiment of the word and Jesus in terms of being the logos, uh, who was the word. And they talk about these similarities between the representations of Sophia in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. This focus on peace, shared power, and the revelation of God as wisdom, counsel, and guidance as comforters and healers and teachers of light. Sophia is represented as a teacher, a mother, and true wealth. She gives shelter, rest, and what is needed for spiritual transformation. So it's just interesting to think about all of that. And you know, a question sometimes I throw out is uh, we, we believe that there'll be a second coming and that Jesus will come again. Uh, is it possible that Jesus will come as a woman? 
something for us to think about. This is another representation. Um, and this, of course, has a very feminine uh, kind of shape to it, these figures. Uh, and this is a representation of the Trinity painted in the 15th century. So, and also we can think about contemporary representations of God, right? And the shack is a book and also a movie. And uh, I forget the actress's name, but uh, in, the, in the depiction, God is a mother and uh, a gentle kind of spirit that guides people. So it was really interesting, I thought, the depiction and what they did with that in the, um, in the movie. Feminist spirituality has a concern and a focus on the holiness and the goodness of all creation. Women have experienced many levels of exploitation, as has the earth. Feminist spirituality prefers webs to ladders, circles and mosques to pyramids, and weaving to buildings. So what that means really is it refers to how power is understood and shared. And so rather than creating hierarchies, um, people in feminist spiritual circles tend to work horizontally and to say, how can we work together and weave something together as opposed to follow in the patriarchal way of building hierarchies? And how can we be more aware of oppressive tendencies in the church and society? How can our prayer, our liturgies and expressions of spiritualities be more mindful of those voices that have not been included? Mary Hunt writes about the ongoing work of feminist spirituality and the contributions of the last five decades. And she has a really good article that's available online, Mapping 40 Years of Feminist Theology. She reminds us of the feminist religious values of justice and equality in the work of feminist spirituality in the community of the church and in the world. And she highlights anti-racism work and listening to queer communities for the voices that have been buried for too long a time. And, you know, as we have said, feminism is about reimagining these categories and queer voices, especially uh, in communities around the world have really been bringing new insights to how we can understand who we are. Um, and also the anti-racism work, when we think about one of the commitments our church, uh, the Disciples Church has made, uh, that's to anti-racist and pro-reconciliation work. And so that's one of the commitments of feminist work as well. As Disciples of Christ, we say that we are a movement. We are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. And feminism and religion are also movements and a movement needs to move as Reverend Dr. William Barber said when I listened to him at General Assembly, which was one of the highlights of my life. Um, she includes the creative spheres in all the ways that they happen in society. Feminist spirituality is at once coalitional and lived out in particular local expressions, whether liturgical, artistic, ritualistic, culinary, or some other form. So I like that in that definition, it kind of includes all of our lives. We don't have to compartmentalize our lives to say that spirituality only happens on a Sunday morning or only happens when we're at Bible study. But in fact, spirituality is fluid throughout our lives. So we're gonna move now to think about spirituality in relation to social justice and to talk about what a movement means in our times. So these are two images that probably are familiar to us. The Idle No More uh, movement, which was a movement and still is a movement of indigenous communities, uh, particularly related to uh, well-being for the earth uh, and also expression of the rights um, and dignities of indigenous people and Black Lives Matter, of course, which has become a major uh, shift in our thinking and perspectives. And when we think about uh, the verdict that was just delivered uh, to Derek Chauvin, who was found guilty uh, of the murder of George Floyd, and what has come up as uh, really a spiritual practice of activism in our time that we haven't seen for a long time. There were uh, movements against the war, you know, in the 70s and that kind of a thing. But we haven't seen, I don't think, the kind of movement uh, of a spiritual nature 
until we saw Black Lives Matter and I will know more. So those are two very important social justice movements in our time. This is, uh, <clears throat> we've seen in athletes, you know, uh, taking a knee, right? And uh, how that became a form of protest. Well, this is the uh, original taking a knee and in front is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and those people who were civil rights activists. Um, you know, and we think about the word uprising and, and for a lot of Christians, I think there's a lot of discomfort with that word um, and discomfort with the idea of getting out into the streets and, and being in the midst of what could be a violent situation, not promoting it, but that violence sometimes comes as a result of people speaking up about their rights after their rights have been denied for a long, long time over many centuries. So taking a knee is a silent form of protest to say that we are here and that this is part of who we are, that we are not going away and that we are gonna bring uh, to light these injustices that have happened in our community. I really like this. Uh, no matter how open-minded, socially conscious, anti-racist I think I am, I still have old learned hidden biases that I need to examine. It is my responsibility to check myself daily for my stereotypes, prejudice, and ultimately discrimination. So um, in a word, this is something that especially those of us uh, who are Caucasian um, have to be aware of. It's something we all have to be aware of, but in terms of privilege, uh, white privilege is a reality that for many of us uh, in, in um, contexts that are uh, culturally uh, normative, white, middle class, uh, upper class to say, what is our role? And that role is different than what is the role for somebody who is not Caucasian. And then how do we bring all those conversations together uh, to move forward in a movement to social justice? And I believe Christianity we know is a movement. We may have gotten a bit far away from our origins, <laughs> but how do we get back to some of those origins as, as Christians and realize that a movement's gotta move? Spiritual activism and eco justice. So I like these words from writer and activist Ayano Nagawaki Waga. It is essential for us to practice spiritual activism that works to transform all structures of hierarchy and exclusion and is based on a spiritualized understanding of ourselves, not as individuals and as part of a larger interconnected world. We need to create movements that call for an awakening to honor the self the body, the communities, the earth, our ancestors, and all that is connected. And it's a wonderful article that I found online at the intersection of spirituality and social justice. So that's something that you can check out and uh, find. And many of these things that are being published now by activists are, are really kind of easily accessible. And they say some really profound things about what it means to actually be spiritual in the world. Um, and they associate that spirituality with a kind of activism. So um, I don't know that Greta Thunberg is a religious person or a spiritual person, but some people might talk about her kind of activity as a Swedish activist uh, on behalf of the earth as a kind of activism. Um, and maybe that is something that Christianity is being called to uh, in the current circumstances where we know that we are in the midst of great climate change and the collapse of a lot of our systems around the world. The scriptural foundations of social justice. And again, this could be a whole course within itself. Uh, this is just basically introducing a few thoughts and I'm sure you have your own that are very meaningful to you in terms of um, social justice and scripture and what it means today. The call to justice in Christianity in relation to the earth and our relationships. So that's basically the foundation of, of who we are. God makes a covenant with every living creature through Noah. This is the sign of the covenant, a rainbow that I make with you and your descendants and every living creature and the waters will never again destroy all flesh. And that's from Genesis 9, 8 to 15. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? 
to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And we all know that's from Micah 6, 8. Excuse me, another passage that might be meaningful to people. Now the full number of them, this is from Acts, the full number of them who believed were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold to them, and they brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. So that's a vision of social justice, really, and a vision of shared power and shared resources. And that is also at the root and the heart of feminist theology and spirituality. We're going to talk a bit about poverty in Canada to think about social justice from a Canadian lens. In 2011, Canada ranked 21st out of 27 uh, countries in terms of poverty levels with uh, one in seven or 4.9 million people living in poverty, including 1.34 million children. Indigenous peoples in Canada experienced the highest levels of poverty a shocking one in four Indigenous peoples, which includes Aboriginal, Métis, and Inuit, or 25% are living in poverty, and four in 10, or 40% of Canada's Indigenous children live in poverty. Close to 15% of people with disabilities are living in poverty, 59% of whom are women. Gender, ethnicity, and poverty. So female lone parent families are significantly poorer than all other household types in Canada. 21% of all single mothers are low income compared to just 5.5% of married couples. Women are also very much more likely to be poor and this is around the globe. Racialized communities face high levels of poverty. The 2006 census, the most recent data that was there showed that the overall poverty rate for racialized peoples was 22%, double the rate of non-racialized peoples. In two of Canada's largest cities, far more than half of all people living in poverty were from racialized groups, 58% in Vancouver and 62% in Toronto. And one in five racialized families live in poverty compared to one in 20 non-racialized families. And that information is from the Poverty Institute. So justice in relation to the community. Idle no more and many indigenous peoples name as a priority our relationship with the earth and the peoples on the earth. And we can think about social justice from many different perspectives. Um, we talked a bit about poverty. We can talk in Canada about missing and murdered indigenous women as an increasingly worrisome reality and a social justice issue. Almost 70% of indigenous girls and women who have disappeared end up murdered. This impacts First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. Though these women make up only 3% of the population, they are overrepresented in prisons and in death rates in the female Canadian population. Almost 60% of missing women and girls in Saskatchewan are of Aboriginal ancestry. And so one of the areas uh, in our church commitments needs to be to make a commitment uh, in our spirituality around missing and murdered Aboriginal women. When we think about ecological wellness in Canada, and for many groups, uh, including Indigenous and Black communities, um, ecological wellness is part and parcel of who they are. When we think about our spiritual heritage uh, for the uh, Israelite people, the land was, was who they were. And when they did not have a land, they did not have an identity or a home. And so we cannot separate these when we talk about you know, who we are and our spirituality. And we know we have an ecological crisis that's happening in our world, and here are some facts from our own country. Less than 1% of native prairie land in Alberta and Saskatchewan enjoys any legal protection. From 1990 to 2015, Saskatchewan alone lost 3.3 million acres of its native grassland to plowing. And we know that many species, including right whales, polar bears, and many other species will face extinction 
if we do not change the habits so that their habitats are protected. So these are some of the issues that we can think about. You know, what does it mean to have uh, Christian spirituality in relation to thinking about some of these issues? And we can think about our own context uh, wherever we are in Canada. Canadian theologian Charlotte Caron writes, I come from a place of wide horizons that invite looking far into the future and seeing expanding possibilities. Vulnerability is made real by the geography. The prairie is flat. There is no hiding, not uh, only open land and sky. Feminist spirituality, then we can say, is contextual and very much shaped by our places and our spaces. Another woman says, I think the way the prairie shaped my spirituality is that the prairie did give me a sense of a largesse of God in the sense that life and God and all those things were infinite. It's a sense of the infinite. It's never ending and there are no boundaries to God. That's an interesting way, right, to think about God. No boundaries to God. And again, this comment, the prairies are quite dry. And even to look at them, you would think that they are dead. You think it's dead, but all of a sudden it will burst into a million crocuses or a million lilies. And I've seen that when I've been out in the prairies and it's a beautiful sight. So when we think about these images, we can think about how nourishment and awe are two spiritual values that can, I think, help us to climb out of this well that we've gotten ourselves deep into in terms of our ecological crisis. In these descriptions of the prairie from Jean Waters' text, Expanding Horizons, stories of the spirituality of Canadian prairie women, we hear about the importance of the relationship between land and sea and how we can perceive God in the land, the sea, and the people. And, you know, as I had said, I wrote about women's experiences uh, during the ecological system collapse of the fishery, the codfish fishery in Newfoundland. We see this especially in the massive decline of the codfish fishery in the early 1990s, in Newfoundland and Labrador, which led to the closure of the fishery, but also the near complete collapse of the codfish species. But there is hope in women and other groups who are raising their voices to challenge injustice and who also find this beauty, um, even in the midst of collapse and the death of so many communities, so many little out poor communities that depended on fishery, people found a way to start again. And so there is hope in that and redemption in that. This is a picture of a local woman. Um, So the Nova Scotia Supreme Court ruled in March that the, March, that the Provincial Environment uh, Department did not consult adequately with the people of the Sepetnik Band, of whom Nicholas is a member, about Aboriginal and treaty rights regarding the brining operations. So we know that women, grandmothers uh, in the Indigenous community often are considered water protectors and they have a spirituality that is often not focused on, but I think it's one that we can consider for our future. And it's something we can find hope in. And so here's this woman, um, Marian Nicholas, staring at this um, hole that has appeared because of the kind of operations that these companies were doing. Uh, and she and others are very concerned with what's happening. And so they're trying to put a stop to this for the damage that is doing to the environment. Um, because for them, their spirituality is inextricably linked with the land. And so any hurt that is done to the land is also done to them and to their people. And really to us all. So justice is, what is justice? It's hope and awe and action. Um, we can take from these images um, ways in which people have risen up and challenged what has been injustice. Um, we can take from feminist voices and theology and spirituality ways in which we can reimagine and hope for the future. Uh, we can talk about those voices that have not been included and all those are aspects of hope in our spiritual lives. And then we have to take action, uh, which is something sometimes we get stuck uh, with as a church. But how can we take action in terms of these 
uh, conversations. So I just kind of listed what I think are some of the basic elements of what it is to have conversations and take action. So it's to realize that we have social injustice and then to realize that social unrest is part of a good response um, for those communities that are starting to rise up and challenge what that social injustice has been. Uh, then we need social dialogue and we need resistance. We need to start uh, having moments of civil disobedience uh, where we get those picket uh, signs and we get those protest signs. And as Christians, not to be afraid to step out and be part of that. And then to develop allyship and solidarity. So with queer communities, this is a conversation that has been ongoing. Um, to, to say, you know, maybe I don't identify as part of this community, but I identify as an ally. And so I'm willing to stand up and support you and be there with you. So all of those things are part of what it means um, to be people who are part of the struggle. And so for those of us who are uh, Caucasian, especially, um, it's, it's a lot about keeping quiet and listening to the stories that we need to listen to that have often gone unheard. So feminist spirituality, if we are to summarize a little bit, um, these are some of the broad strokes of what we can talk about in terms of um, what describes feminist spirituality. It's integrative, so it seeks to bring together diverse voices. It's about listening, being aware of the power and privilege in all dialogues, and being willing to listen to others. It's multicultural, <clears throat> composed of a variety of all people who identify women with voices uh, to share. It's symbolic and inclusive. And so we, we don't see language as one thing, we see language as pluralistic uh, and people can come and be part of many conversations. And so maybe God, um, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, uh, all our images in the Christian life can be multiple images rather than trying to box God in and imagine God in just one way. Though there is one God, there can be many expressions of who that God is. Um, and so also uh, feminist spirituality is contextual and embodied. And so we experience and talk about uh, what that spirituality is for us from our own contexts and is embodied because we recognize that the body is not separate from the mind or the spirit, that in fact, we strive to be integrated. And finally is justice making, is to see the freedom of expression and the inclusion of all people in our religious imagery or symbolism and the life of the church and in all religious circles. And we understand that people who, you know, the conversation between people who are spiritual but not religious, and so I think the more that the church can be open to that, and if there was a term I would get rid of entirely in the church, it's the term unchurched, because I think it's a very exclusivist idea. And it's um, a term that doesn't recognize that God is everywhere and operates and is active in all human beings and all life. And so we don't need to put labels on how it is that that happens and calling people on church, I think is a way we will totally isolate people from any conversation. And so uh, finally to wrap up to the, what we can say about social justice is that we try to find beauty and awe that inspires us everywhere as we know that God is everywhere. And I saw this beautiful sign in downtown Dartmouth, which says the beauty of everyday things. And so perhaps part of our um, opportunity is to start to see the beauty in all things that are around us. And maybe uh, if we do that as Christians, that will inspire other people to be part of an ongoing uh, multi-dialogical conversation between us all. And so when it comes to creating social justice, what are some of the concrete roles that we can take on? Well, we can be an ally to people who are suffering. Uh, we can seek to be and to become aware of our own biases and our lack of welcome. And that's in the church as well, um, as in the wider society. We can be a movement for love and be willing to be shaped 
by ecological justice issues and by the voices that are sharing those issues. Um, you know, I'd love to see an activist come in and speak to a congregation, you know, and see what that experience will be like for people in terms of understanding our own spirituality. What else, uh, excuse me, what would you add? Um, so I thought uh, as we closed, we could go into groups maybe uh, again for 10 minutes. I'll make sure I give you the full 10 minutes this time. A final question for reflection after thinking about today, who and where is the church called to be in the next 10 years? And I thought that would just be um, a way that we could have conversation. And I'm going to not share my screen anymore if I can figure out how to do that. Great. And I'm going to invite us to go into uh, breakout rooms and think about after reflecting on some of the things that I've shared today and your own thoughts, um, where do we need to go in the next 10 years in the church, especially in relation to social justice and some of these conversations. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes and uh, I'm going to then uh, let you know that our time will be up. Okay. Nolly, did you not get a room? Do you want to go into? Do you want to go into a room? Yeah, please. Okay, let me sign you. Uh, room three. There you go.
Welcome back. <laughs> so welcome back, everybody. And uh, I'm excited and eager to hear what ideas you came up with. So uh, the floor is open for whoever would like to share. Carolyn? I guess I guess I'll go because I don't see any hands up. So we had actually a very dynamic conversation. It wasn't um, it wasn't very long. I'm sure we could have spoke for a much longer time. I think the general consensus and agreement among the three people in the group that I was with with, which was Hubert Reese and Elizabeth, uh, was that was that it's time we we need to be more inclusive and the more inclusive includes um everybody really you know for, uh, we just need to become more inclusive um that was that was i think the g the gist of the the conversation and i think that um uh, we all got pretty passionate about, about the conversation that we were we were trying to discuss it, right? You know, because um, uh, it, it it's not an easy task, and and uh, the, we all felt that that was the situation as well. It's not an easy task, um, but when it comes to being inclusive, it includes everybody, which includes you know the street people, and it includes the poor people and it includes the gay people and it includes the indigenous people and the people of color and the you know it includes everybody so that just kind of um that you know how we go about doing that i don't know but that that was uh, our conversation so great it was, a, it was a fun conversation actually good thank you In our conversation, Janet and April and I was also a very um, rich conversation. And um, I think the gist of it was that in 10 years, we will be different, mm -hmm. that we will have learned some lessons during this time. And, and I think one of the big lessons is that we need to be um, continually growing and evolving and um, uh, open to change. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yeah, a week. We were talking about, um, you know, saying we're welcoming in our churches, but how we can show that we are and actually be welcoming. And so we actually talked about um, if Jesus would be welcome in each of our churches. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are bringing up, you know, Jesus is a carpenter. Jesus would be a laborer today. And so if this laborer came in in their work clothes, would they be comfortable? And we talked about, I think all of us had an experience of showing up to church in our Sunday best and how maybe that's not, you know, that's just one of the ways that we can change the culture. Um, to be more accessible and be more welcoming to people who come for the first time is if they see that we're dressed regularly, that there is no hierarchy in class and status by how we wear, or how the pastor or the leadership team dresses. That could be one way that we actually are welcoming to people of different uh, backgrounds. Um, so we were talking about if Jesus would be welcome. Um, so I think that was a good image in our mind. Uh, to really think about how we act as churches and how we can be welcoming, maybe for the first time or more welcoming. Great. Excellent. 
And anything anybody wanted to add in addition from any of the other groups or, or any of the groups? We also talked about how um, we didn't, know, well, in our church anyway, I don't think we initially were thinking about the fact that if we had to change to a different type of worship, like an online worship, um, that really meant that you had to have a computer of some sort. Mm -hmm. right or um we didn't get so far as to say or even internet access but you know even if churches could have a number of tablets or something that could be loaned out to people that maybe couldn't afford to have something like that for these situations then you're you're kind of prepared for it so no one is feeling left out automatically because even whether you do an email service or whether you do, you know, any of the other types of things we were doing, it still required that you had to have a computer and you had to have internet. So I think the other thing is maybe as churches, there's something we can do to lobby governments to do something about the cost of internet. You know, mm -hmm. those providers, it, it's cost an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good thoughts. Yeah, Carolyn. I just, I just had to comment. I really, really liked what Awit said. It's, it's, it's a, a nice practical thing of, of thinking, hey, yeah, maybe I can go in my gardening clothes. So if you folks at Windhome, if we ever get to meet again, see me coming pretty loose and, and casual, because I really think that that is certainly a part of it. You know, it is a part of it. Like, uh, it's a part of, it's a part of it, Awit. So thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, I think in some ways we we kind of think we we only show a certain self on a Sunday morning, you know, as only one side of ourselves or something. So why are we closing off kind of these other parts of ourselves and and deciding that they're not worthy of being shown or just to be as we are? So yeah, it's a good question. Jana? Yeah, I was just going to share something. Yeah. That is that um, in Mapleton, we're a very rural congregation and there was a, um, a chance or there was a, a family that would often miss church. And I, I asked after a while, you know, we just chatting and it was because they did not have enough time to get from doing their chores, which was they ran a dairy, a huge dairy operation to getting into church in time in their Sunday best. And so, you know, we had a conversation about it and said, you don't have to have, I'd rather you be there in your, you know, barn clothes than not be there because you can't get your Sunday best on in time. And as it turns out, you know, they became, they're, they're very involved in the church. And they're very committed to the church. So, yeah, so sometimes we don't even think what some of these barriers, how they isolate or, or stop people until you have the conversation with them. So it's not something, I think one of the things course, is to listen because we can't know everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that definitely is a, a problem that many of us fall into is that we think we know how to, to fix it. We think we know what is needed. And sometimes we have to just listen to the people to see, you know, the people that we're talking to, the people who are in front of us to actually understand what they need. You know, what we talked about the dogs who are very good at telling us what they need. Well, sometimes we have to listen to what others need rather than we think this is what people need. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit of a challenge to the golden rule, isn't it? Yeah, maybe it's not always do unto others as we would have them do unto us. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Noli? Another thing. Uh, usually some folks, some people would, will, will actually uh, hide from church because they, they feel that they are uh, not worth it. That, that that still they have to do something to deserve the church, mm -hmm. right? But that's not that's not how it is. Mm -hmm. We don't deserve anything, mm -hmm. right? But Jesus, as 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 I keep uh, as I tell the uh, uh, Awit and and Paula, 
Jesus knows who we are and he knows what we need. And sometimes church members will judge people, judge, because why are we here? You have some, some personal issues that you need to fix. What? I'm here because I want to be fixed. Mm. Right? There is a hospital because there are sick people. And there is a church who needs, who, uh, that I need to go to in order to fix myself. Mm. And the church, the members, we are the nurses. We're the doctors. It's a nice image. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Thank you, Nolan. You, yeah, Hubert. Oh, Hubert, I think you're on mute. Sorry for that. Yes, we had a very lively discussion too. And as Carolyn and Elizabeth said, that um, we were just getting the fire up and our 10 minutes ran out. But um, I, think we, um, I think we all come to realize that um, because of COVID and the experiences that we all have, um, the church will definitely take a better form um, in, an, in another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that would be impacted on how we look at what is important now and some of the emotional losses that some of us had, um, some of the lives we've seen um, just disappear in a few days um, from some of our close ones who were today, they're healthy, um, you know, they're doing quite fine in a few days, um, you know, they're gone. So that helps us to kind of be a little bit more sobering to realize what is important. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk about being inclusive and this is something that um, our church always is insisting to be inclusive. But I think that it goes further than that to understand what that means. And um, as Awit and, and Noeli said, I mean, like sometimes when a person isn't dressed up to attend church and thing. I mean, like, you know, they just don't get the attention or from the group that is usually there. And um, I look at the situation in our church where we are downtown um, in the vicinity of some um, of some hostels, men's hostels, and um, it's well, it's now the 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 community is developing, but. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially in the summertime, a homeless person may walk in mm -hmm. and um, that person would sit around until I guess they're tired. Um, if there's like a lunch or snack, they would partake of it. But they're usually alone. And um, I think we don't have like the, the knowledge and the expertise to approach that person. We don't know what to say to them. So someone talk about education. I think those are some of the things we have to equip ourselves, how to make those kind of approach to those to people who might yeah. not be in a regular circle um, and so on. So going forward, I think that because probably some of us spend more time in our community rather than you know going to our church group and stuff and able to see some of the the changes and you know the needs and stuff that's happening within our immediate community that we probably didn't notice before. I think um, that those knowledge would be brought forward in our church um, in the next ten years to make it different, to include to make it really more inclusive, to understand the different cultures, the different you know the different racial um, personnel and stuff like that. Thank you, Hubert. Yeah, a lot of really good points there. Who else? I do want to mention uh, when you get the recording on the last page, there will be a bit of a bibliography. And one of the things I've discovered recently is a journal of um, mental health 
theology, mental health, and disability. And this is very brand new and it's fantastic. Um, people are not scholars who are writing the articles, but they are very learned and they are people who are contributing to a different way of doing theology. And as someone who's read a lot of theology, uh, and Janet probably too, um, this is a new, these are new voices. And so it's refreshing to, they're not long articles, they're a few pages. Uh, you can access it all online. The first volume has just been put out and it's really refreshing, enlightening, challenging, all those good things. So some of the things we've been talking about in our discussion would definitely be some things you could explore uh, in reading and reflecting on some of those articles. So just a tip about that. And very easy, you just have to click on it um, and, and the articles will be there for you to read and even print. So I encourage you to check that out. So I guess we're pretty much at time. So thank you everybody, it's been wonderful. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was nice to see everybody. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Enjoyed. Thank you.